Yeah, so let me introduce this title. Uh, and presentation Stranger Than Fiction Tall Tales in the Life of Sakamoto Ryo. Go ahead. All right, good evening, everybody. Everybody can hear me? Oh, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> All right, do we have any history buffs in the house? Not even one? Yeah, keep going, keep going. Anybody uh, familiar with Sakamoto Ryoma at all? Seen him in a movie or on TV? All right, excellent. So I'm sure that we're all very, very familiar with the history of the Meiji Restoration and all, but just a quick you know, refresher course for anybody who might have forgotten. <clears throat> so we're talking about the 1880s when um, Sakamoto Ryoma was born in 1836 in Tosa Domain, down here in modern-day Kochi Prefecture. So at the time, the Tokugawa Bakufu in Edo was kind of on its last legs. And a number of these outlying domains were sort of looking to overthrow it. <clears throat> so I say, after 300 years, it was collapsing under foreign domestic pressure. So Sakamoto Ryoma was a young, violent radical, like many other people at the time. The story has it that he was sent to assassinate Katsu Kaishu, a Bakufu minister. But Katsu Kaishu was so persuasive that he kind of won him over, not quite to his side, but to a more moderate position. And after that, he sort of worked to find a political solution for the problems of the time. So finally, in 1866, he helped to broker an alliance between Satsuma and Choshu. And this alliance was the one that would eventually finally help to overthrow the shogunate to bring about the major restoration. So it was a side business. While he was doing this, he had his own private kind of business company that he called the Kayentai, using some of the warships that were being imported to also move goods around. Sadly, unfortunately, in 1867, his enemies finally got to him. He was assassinated right before the major restoration, and his work had kind of come to fruition. All right, Romeo was also very well known for the many women in his life, you know, strong, independent women, <laughs> in spite of this kind of demeaning sounding title that I've given this slide. A number of strong women, including his sister Otome, who we can see over here, Shiba Sanako, the daughter of his kendo instructor, who was allegedly his fiance at one point, Otose, who was the owner of an inn in Kyoto, who would kind of shelter him from his enemies, and finally Oryo, his wife, who was working as a, as a maid at that inn where he met her. Over here, this is a panel from the manga Oiryoma by Takata Ketsuya and Oyama Yu. And you can see his sister, she's saying, you have to become a strong samurai Ryoma. And uh, oops. Ryoma's kind of a little crybaby. He's like, oh, you know, and she's kind of showing him how to. And allegedly, she was a very skilled swordswoman in her own right. So these are some of the images of Ryoma that we find in popular culture. This actually is a poster for a film called uh, Tengaramon, which came out a couple of years ago. You might have seen it. This is not Ryoma, it's a Satsuma samurai, but Ryoma appears in the story, and you can see him holding up his sword here. <laughs> this is a very kind of iconic image, what we imagine him looking like. So there's Ryoma the free thinker, who kind of defied his domain to kind of set his own path in life. There's Ryoma the businessman, as we've discussed, he had his business ventures as well. Ryoma the man of peace, who preferred political solutions to violence. The international was friends with foreigners, for example, some of the merchants who were working in Nagasaki, like Thomas Glover. I like this one, the young hero against a gerontocracy, I call it, sort of the rule of the elderly, which maybe we still see a bit of in Japan today, which continues again, yeah, to dominate. A modern man who treated women as equals, as often said. And finally, you know, perhaps most notably, the tragic hero who died young enough not to see himself become the villain, as you know, they say in Batman the Dark Knight. <laughs> so I want to ask a couple of questions tonight, beginning with why is Ryoma so popular? Why are there so many books, movies, and TV shows about him? This is what's um, hanging outside one of those photo booths. It's an illustration of kind of the magic that it can work. <laughs> I thought it was fitting because we're talking about kind of how images are altered, you know, in popular culture. How do fictional materials of Ryoma compare with his own letters, our best source of information about him, and descriptions we have from other people who lived at the time? What do we make of the memoirs of his wife, Oryo, which she related to interviewers late in her life because she kind of wanted to set the record straight herself? And finally, and to me most intriguingly, what is the difference between historical fact and historical fiction, if there is one? Now, a word of um, disclaimer here. I'm only a PhD student. I'm not a real academic. So take all this with a grain of salt. It's possible that I missed some kind of disclaimer in on one of my sources that said this is all made up. But we're talking about making things up tonight. So, so <laughs> I think it's kind of on point. All right, now I want to tease one of Oreo's stories to kind of get the ball rolling here. This is. Uh, Ryoma the big drinker, and they've got to kind of imagine like an old lady kind of telling the story, like Rose at the beginning of Titanic. <laughs> Ryoma could certainly drink a large amount, 
It was spring in the third year of Keio, or 1867. He was headed back to Fushimi with his comrades. Saying, let's each have a cup of chilled sake for the road, he slipped into the next izakaya and filled up a big old bowl, at least one sho, five go, which is about five pints, deep with booze. Let's each down one of these in a go. Fine by me, said Tsukuno Kakube. He stretched out his neck, he took the bowl in both hands, and he started gulping it down, but poor Kakusan couldn't get down more than a show before he had to catch his breath. Nako Kishintaro was also very famous at the time. Went next, and he finished off about 70%. Hiryasu Sasuke managed 80%, but only Ryoma managed to get the whole thing down, and then he barfed it all out, and it looked just like a rain dove. <laughs> when I was up previewing this for some of my classmates, they said, Jake, you've got to lead with that drinking story, or you're going to lose your audience. <laughs> I defended you. I said, these are educated people. I'm sure just because it's in a pub, they're not only interested in drinking. But I took a suggestion anyway. All right, Real Madan. Did anybody see in Real Madan um, 2011 when it aired? Oh. So the Taiga drama that NHK does on a historical subject every year. In 2010, it was um, about Ryoma. So we can see here some of the elements of kind of the Ryoma legend coming into place. He was played by popular young singer-songwriter Fukuyama Masuhari, because he looks very young and handsome. And he plays him for the whole series. They kind of put on the makeup to make him look a bit older in the later years, but this is basically what he looked like for the whole run of it. Another interesting part of the legend that you see by this point is the idea that he had a kind of personal code against killing, again like Batman. He sort of used martial arts to disarm his opponents rather than having to take their lives. I'll discuss later how accurate this might be. There's a lot of emphasis, of course, in his romantic entanglements, especially with Chiba Sanako, the daughter of the dojo instructor that I mentioned before. And in contrast, uh, you see a couple of materials of other characters. Goto Shojiro, who is a very high-ranking samurai who worked with him, is shown in Ryomadan as this violent bully who like, beats people up. In his letters, Ryoma speaks to him very highly. And the domain lord, Yamauchi Yodo of Tosa, is shown as this like, paranoid old drunk. I'm researching to what extent this is true, but I kind of suspect that it's you know, uh, artistic license because the story needs villains, as I say. All right, this is the most boring slide, but please just bear with me. <laughs> for those of you who aren't into literary fiction. So the first historical novel featuring Ryoma was published way back in 1883, very shortly after his death. But the most famous one was probably Ryoma ga Yuku by Shiba Ryotaro, who we see here. It's a very, very long book, over a thousand pages. I'm trying to work my way through it. It has not been translated, so I'm reading it in Japanese. It was also adapted as a taiga drama further back in 1968. Shiba himself actually drew heavily on the research of an American academic, Marius Janssen, who wrote a book called um, Sakamoto Ryoma and the Meiji Restoration. Janssen claims that when he was writing in the 60s, Ryoma was not very famous, so he kind of credits himself a bit for making him so famous. To me, Shiba's book reads like an odd hybrid between fact and fiction. It'll kind of be telling the story in a fictionalized way, and he'll drop in this historical fact, like, oh, by the way, you know, this scholar says this. And again, it's this interesting interplay between the you know, fictional, fictional and the factual, sorry. <laughs> but I would say in spite of his very good research, he sometimes plays a little bit fast and loose with the facts. It's usually just a little thing, like a date of when something happened or if two people met each other. But as I say, the little details kind of make you wonder about the bigger picture. All right, so finally we get to Ryoma's wife, Oryo. <clears throat> she was born in 1841 in Kyoto as Narasaki Ryo, hence Oryo. Her father was a doctor who was also very into politics on the anti-shogunate side. Ryoma, to demonstrate her character, Ryoma tells a story in one of her letters about how um, a pimp basically kidnapped Oryo's younger sister and she chased him down to Osaka and threatened him with a, a dagger to rescue her sister. In 1865, she married Ryoma. And according to her, their life in Kyoto involved friendship with other activists, hard drinking, partying, and brushes with mortal danger. However, she didn't get along with his family after his death, which is quite sad. She eventually moved to modern-day Kanagawa Prefecture, where she remarried. Ichisaka Taro, who um, did the translation that I'm working from into modern Japanese, claims that Ryoma had a type, saying that unlike Chiba Sanaka, she was kind of a very strong-willed woman who could hold her own. Narita Ryuichi, another scholar whose work I'm consulting, describes Ryoma as not kind of a traditional old-fashioned man's man, but kind of a woman's man who was able to kind of deal with women on their own terms. But he also had many close you know, friendships with men, so I take that for you know, what it's worth. Now, the Tarade incident, probably one of the most famous incidents in this story. In March of 1866, shogunate agents attacked the Tarade Inn where Ryoma was staying, and Oryo was working as a maid. She ran up this staircase. The present day end is a reconstruction. It burned down, unfortunately, from her bath there to his room. A salacious detail in a lot of these stories is that she was kind of naked because she just came out of her bath and kind of holding her robe closed. 
Neither of them mentioned this. I think that if it had been true, Ryoma probably would have mentioned it. <laughs> like, oh, by the way, when she came to save me, she, but you know. <laughs> so um, in the fight, Ryoma does describe shooting somebody who fell down. So it seems likely that people were killed. So I don't know about that whole sort of Batman code of no killing. Although injured, Hina's bodyguard did manage to escape, thanks to Oreo's help. So Ryoma's description, I would say, is quite chaotic and gritty in his letters when he's describing it. In contrast, Oreo's description is a bit more exciting, and she just depicts him and his body are kind of mocking their attackers. Ha ha ha, he laughed. You cowards, why don't we come over there and we'll cut, cut, cut you all down. And his bodyguard says, you have nothing to gain here. If you're thinking of running, you'd better do so now, which, you know, <laughs> it's kind of like dialogue from like a cheap samurai movie, but who knows, because sometimes people do actually talk like this in real life. And this is an illustration from the book. You know, this very famous image of him with his pistol and his bodyguard with the, the spear. So unfortunately, we don't have time to tell all of these stories, but I thought I'd just preview a few more of the sensational anecdotes. She talks about a, a Ryoma and Katsu Kaishu hosting a drunken uh, party in which many of the guests, including uh, Oryo and Ryoma, dressed in drag. Unbeknownst to them, the Shinsengumi, the Shogunate Auxiliary Police, were staying on the floor right below, and they complained about the noise. So everybody escaped by jumping out the windows. But immediately, Ryoma was like, ah, you know, that's far enough. Let's get some soba. So they're eating the noodles, and he sees that the soba vendor is armed, so he assumes that he must be a secret police officer. So he punches him out, and then they all run away again. <laughs> Later, and this is one of my favorite stories, Kirino Toshiaki was one of the four most famous assassins of the Bakamatsu period. Ryo Oryo alleges that he came to the inn, and he got drunk, and he said, you know, you, come to my room. And she tried to fight back with the sword that Ryoma had given her. And one of uh, Kirino's friends said, wait a second, that sword, that's the sword Ryoma gave her. And Kirino was like, ah. <laughs> so he immediately backed off. And the next day, he took her to lunch. And he's like, there's no need to tell Ryoma about this, right? <laughs> On a ship bound for Satsuma, after the Teradia attack, she talks about them playing a drinking game and then trying to shoot these clay jars off the railing of the ship. <laughs> a bit dangerous, perhaps. But you know, what do I know? And finally, there are a lot of very interesting little incidents that have nothing to do with Ryoma. She's just talking about walking through the woods at night when she bumps into sort of the corpse of a suicide victim that's just hanging there. It's a great read. I really recommend it. So finally, when Oreo was discussing Sonika, I got to this point. Sonika, you know, the daughter of the, the kendo instructor. I thought, wouldn't it be funny if she'd said something a little bit catty about her? But oh my god, listen to this. <laughs> so she says, it seems that kendo instructor Chibashu Sako's daughter was, unlike her father, a lewd and lascivious woman. Ever since an age when the folds in her clothes were still crisp, she amused herself by sending love letters to every single student in the dojo. And when there was no student handy, she practiced her wiles on any young man she could get her hands on. She truly was incorrigible, but if she had at least been pretty, somebody might have taken her up on it, if only to get in good with the master. As it was, she was ugly and pitiful, selfish, violent, and in spite of this all, very jealous. So everybody steered clear of her. By the way, she tried to send Ryoma a love letter when he joined the dojo, but he did his best to keep away from her, too. However, one thing that cannot be doubted is that she did have a very deep, you know, she was very close to Ryoma, she missed him. At the very end, she's kind of describing to the interviewer why she wanted to tell this story, and she says, Rainer son, I never stopped caring and worrying over Ryoma, so I hope that everyone will at least remember the things that I worked for as well. There are so many errors in this book, which was that first biography that I mentioned before, um, A Sweat and Blood Journey of a Thousand Miles. It really makes me upset. But things often don't go as we wish, if Ryoma were still alive, more fun and exciting things would be sure to happen, but I suppose this is what they call fate. Although it feels as if he died only yesterday, it's already been 33 years. So the question is, is Oryo a reliable narrator? This is her tombstone. It says basically, you know, the wife of Sakamoto Ryoma. It mentions nothing about her own accomplishments or her second husband, poor guy. I would say some of the stories just sound a little bit too good to be true. They're like something in a movie. I think the Toshiaki story is a good example. But that's very debatable. There are some things that seem a bit more suspect that are pretty big coincidences. Like she tells a story about happening to run into Saigo Takamori after he quits the government. Just happening to run into him on the road. He's traveling alone. He has the time to speak to her. Anyway, makes me wonder a bit. She's not shy about revealing her biases. For example, when she's talking about Sonika, by the way, nobody else describes Sonico in remotely those terms. <laughs> but you have to ask, why didn't these stories make it into Ryoma Den or any of the novels? Sexism may be partly to blame. You know, she's kind of discounted. It may be that people share my doubts about the truth of the stories, but then the authors make up their own you know, stuff. So go figure. 
So to come to this question finally, what is literary fiction? This is a very nice quote by an American author, William Styron. He's talking about Leo Tolstoy in War and Peace, describing the Battle of Borodino where the French uh, were defeated by the Russians. And he says, a historian can tell you just what happened at the Battle of Borodino, but only Tolstoy, often dispensing with facts, can tell you what it really was to be a soldier at Borodino. This is what the distinction is, and this is what I insist is the novelist's prerogative when he is faced with the materials of history. So he's kind of saying there's a deeper, almost like spiritual truth in history that you can't get just by looking at what happened. I like that idea, but it's mysterious the more you think about it, because if it's more than the facts, who gets to decide what that true truth was? But on the other hand, all of these so-called sources are told to us by people who had their own biases, just like Oryo. Who's to say that they're any more reliable? And finally, to really get into the weeds of theory here, some people will say that because history has passed and you can't actually verify what happened, it kind of doesn't exist. So, you know, more of a thought experiment, I would say, than a, you know, an idea that you would seriously consider, but I think it's interesting. All right, last of all, some closing thoughts. I would say that when we read sources about Ryomo, we have this feeling that we knew him personally, almost like um, somebody else's name is escaping me. He was talking about Sherlock Holmes. He said, when you read the Sherlock Holmes stories, you feel he must have been a real person, and moreover, that you kind of knew him. And I'd say, whether or not this is accurate, there's a remarkable consistency to this kind of imaginary Ryomo, where different authors kind of have the same feeling about who he was. I'd say the labels, editions come, uh, labels and definitions come and go, but this attraction that we have to him stays the same. And whether it's literally true or not, I believe that Oreo's stories convey, in Styron's words, what Ryomo is really like, and that they're valuable for this reason. All right, so at the end of all these academic presentations, oh, wait, no, this isn't a conference presentation. It's just a talk <laughs> in a pub. I don't have to show my sources. I'm just kidding. Of course, I have my sources. Please, 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 kid, uh, don't kick me out. <laughs> and if you're interested in uh, learning more, you know, certainly I would recommend any of these books. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I even learned the proper way to cite a TV drama in <laughs> my highfalutin college education. But yeah, thank you for your attention. And please, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Do we know if he met the area's most famous Scotsman, Donald Glover? He's certainly shown meeting Glover in the Rioma Den. I believe that it's not, uh, I don't think it's definitively established that he did. Other people like Iwasaki Yatoro, the founder of Mitsubishi, does talk about his friendship with Glover. But unfortunately, I don't think we know for sure. All right, anybody else? I'm sorry that it was all in English. <laughs> But if you like, you know, maybe Raymond to translate, I'd be happy to. Gamma te kotayo to sere. I'm not a big fan of the, into this kind of stories, so I don't know exactly what you're talking about. Is written or historical event? And it, well, I'm wondering where, well, whether there's a, a historical data that describes like Ryo Masakamoto correctly in terms of academic senses. I, I'm not sure because the Shiba Ryotero Shiba makes a secondary popular, but his writing is correct or not. I'm not sure. So, so how well, would you, Japanese people should or, or preserve the real data about the Sakamoto do, do you have any idea about that? That's a very good question. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's difficult because, like I mentioned before, I think that our best source is his letters, and we also have you know, descriptions of him from other people at the time. But it's sort of like during his lifetime, people didn't necessarily know that he was going to be so famous, so they didn't you know, set down things in a verifiable way at the time. So all we can really do is look at the kind of first-hand accounts, maybe biased, maybe inaccurate, compare them with each other, and try and figure out what was probably the case. But I would definitely say that all of these, you know, this historical fiction, we do have to look at it a bit skeptically. And especially with Shiba Rotaro, he wrote so much and he's so famous that a lot of times people do kind of mix up a bit maybe the things that were his um, ideas and the things that are mentioned in documents from the time. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> Uh, any other historical figure, uh, Japanese historical figure, actually let's not say just Japanese, like any other historical figure that has had like a comparable 
don't know. Not, not a rewriting of history, but like you said, like this literary thing um, has happened to somebody else in history across the world. Any good examples? That's a really good question. Like you mentioned, you compared actually um, him to George Washington. Marius Janssen, in his introduction, compares him to, what is it, um, Davy Crockett? <laughs> yeah. Um, Do we have to explain who Davy Crockett is? He was also a political radical who died fighting the, the powers that be. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, in the Bakamatsu era alone, I think there are lots of figures who have They've tried to give them a similar treatment, like uh, Godai Tomoatsu, who is the star of that other movie who was on the poster. I think Ryoma is kind of one of the most um, conspicuous ones, maybe because the sources in his letters are fairly good. And also, during the Meiji period, some people from Tosa in the government kind of helped to boost his image, so that might have gotten the ball rolling. But I certainly think that maybe especially in Japan, people do kind of like this, um, I don't want to call it myth-making, because you know, often there's a very serious um, like purpose behind it. But this kind of examination of heroic figures, and that's kind of you know, what my research is really about. Um, I had started with a more broadly looking at the Bakamatsu period. I kind of focused in on Rema because I feel that that's kind of where the richest stuff is. Further questions? No. OK, well, if uh, there's no more questions, then uh, you'll be sticking around a little bit. Oh, right? yeah, if got anything lingering. So uh, yeah, please give another round of applause.